Okay, we are live, 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 live on a Monday morning. A dream, well, it's still not morning anymore. I usually do the show on in the morning, but we had licensing come today. Yay! And that went great, so thanks for asking. But welcome to At The Gardens. My name is Garrett Wilhelm. I'm CEO of Creative Gardens Early Education. We are a company in Virginia, specifically Loudoun County, Virginia, um, building um, personalized education schools done the right way across the area, with the first school being in Ashburn Village and our next school opening in Aldi and South Riding called the Ohana School. So I hope everybody... um, Follows along in that journey, www.theohanaschool.com and www.creativegardensva.com. And I'm here, of course, to bring you as much value, our beautiful community, as I can by having amazing people on the show to talk to us a little bit about education, kids' products, discipline, parenting, all of that jazz. But today, today is an awesome show, guys. I have... Katina Franklin, sweetie, I got it right. Um, She is the program manager or director, I'm not exactly sure, but we're going to get that correct when we get her on the show uh, for the Embark Center for Self-Directed Learning. And if you can imagine, just in that title, we've got a lot of self-directed learners um, in our houses right now due to uh, COVID-19. So before I even dive into that, I want to get her on the show because I want to pick her brain about all the stuff that she's learned in her experience. So without further ado, here is Katina. Are you there? Hold on. Let me uh, unmute you before we, uh, there we go. Hi, now can you hear me? Yay. Yay. Awesome. Hi, Garrett. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, of course. I was really interested. I, I put a shout out onto the Loudoun County Social Collective page of anybody that was interested in joining me on the show. And Katina was one of the amazing people that jumped on because I think, Katina, that you have a ton of value. So before we get started, tell our viewers who you are and what you do. So, hi, I'm Katina Franklin Sweetie, and I'm a program advisor. So, you're almost there at Embark Center for Self Directed Education in Leesburg, Virginia. So, we uh, have been around for a couple of years now. We're going into our fourth year, and we are a center for young people who are looking to learn outside of a traditional environment. Up until this past year, our ages started around 12 to 11, but we've lowered it to six years old for so six to 18. Wow. And basically, most of our members are people that really didn't fit into the traditional school paradigm. They were the square pegs and the round holes, and they were trying really hard, and it wasn't necessarily working for them. We do have some homeschool families that have joined us because they want to have more consistent um, control of what they want to learn and also being with peers and mentors in our community. Um, We are homeschool-based. So we are only open four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Mm -hmm. it's homeschooling as the legal mechanism to make that work because part of our vision is not to, um, let me say it this way, part of our vision is to see learning as a natural lifelong process outside of what we think of as schools nowadays. So schools are so compartmentalized and heavy on testing and Uh, things like that. We are organic and all encompassing. We don't have any age segregation. So the classes that are created by our members themselves don't have age separation. So if you want to take that crimes class, you can take it. If you want to take the Minecraft class, you can take it. So we are a lot different in a school than a school setting in that way. So you value, and first of all, I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. So you're basically destri- describing authentic education, <laughs> which which I would agree with in the sense of, you know, I, you know, I'm the first person to stand against the public schooling system in our country in, in the sense of we, we've crafted a learning environment for kids that's memorization and regurgitation based, and it does not I repeat, does not quantify uh, success in every child as we know now through science, not through, you, you know, random writers and things, but through science that every child learns differently, no matter what their brain looks like, no matter who they are, whether they're quote unquote typically developing or not. Um, yet we still kind of enact this same systemic issue. And I think overall now that we've, we've uh, pivoted into COVID and, and all of that, I think it's pointing out those those deep flaws in education because kids are just walking away even more so now 
checking boxes when education, like you said, which I think you perfectly described, is is much more organic, right? I think uh, true learning comes from experience. And when you're looking at a learning environment, it should be heavily focused on experiential learning, which it sounds to me a lot like what you guys are doing there. Now, <clears throat> my first question to you, because it's such an interesting um, idea, and I love that you guys kind of legally use that homeschool model to make sure that it all fits in and that you guys are, you know, checking all the T's and, and or I'm sorry, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. Now, I think the biggest concern, uh, Katina, with families right now is, uh, and I won't use kind of industry terms, I'll explain it first and then use the industry term, but kids organizing their time, kids organizing their day according to schedules that Loudoun County um, has provided and how to kind of keep kids on those schedules. We talk about it in the industry as executive functioning. How, what's a great tip Right, you do this all the time. You've kind of seen what this looks like in act. What what works for for Embark Center when it comes to helping kids manage their time? So it's a it's a really easy tip, but it's a really hard tip for people to trust, and that is to allow them to choose what they want to learn because yeah. then it's intrinsic motivation. Then they mm. want to work on it. Then they have that desire to have the executive function to make it work. And one of the things that we have seen over and over again, when you have subjects like reading and math and you have to check that box, but let's say you're getting some resistance on that with you know, what we're talking about with organizing your day and having the executive function to make that work. Mm -hmm. We think of it more as instead of math, it's, oh, wow, what are you doing in Minecraft? Or, hey, you're really into baking, so talk to me about what you've been doing with bacon. Baking, bacon. <laughs> which are both um, delicious. Which is delicious. <laughs> like, they're, oh, you just did some fractions right there, or double yeah. the recipe and things like that. And that's what you were saying with this real life, real world learning. And that's how our species, all species, that's how all of us animals learn. And it's only been in the last 150 years or so that we've separated that learning into a building, into a room, into an age group, into a subject. And that's, that's really unnatural. So, but as I said, it's a hard leap to say, you know what, I'm going to let my kid just run amok with dinosaurs and mm -hmm. see where it takes us. And it will take you to amazing places because then they will have that desire to get better at reading or they will have that desire to, to do more and expand themselves to experience what they want to be experiencing. And then for older members that we have, they have to do things that they don't want to do. So it's not all rainbows and unicorns all the time. So right. let's say you're really not into chemistry, but you want to be a veterinary technician. And I have a member that I'm working with that way. And he knows that to, to get in there into that program at the community college, which you can start early as a dual enrolled student. So we have a lot of members that start community college at 16. Love and it. Yeah. And I can talk more about that in a second. But yeah, so yeah. now he has to do chemistry and he doesn't really want to, but he wants to be a veterinary technician. So then you have your intrinsic motivation for that, even though it's something you don't want to do. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. And I, I full fledged agree. Um, you know, we because I think a lot of schools, you know, whether it be uh, early learning, like which is my wheelhouse, or as you get a little bit older, a lot of schools like to put their, even private schools like to put their staple on, here's the curriculum we teach, here's the content we teach, and here's the cadence in which we teach that. And I, I think they've got it wrong when, when that, you know, what we do here in our schools is we know what, what Virginia Department of Education wants us to learn. It's listed, right? You can pull it offline, especially for us, it's the foundation block. So we're pulling those. And then we allow our educators to be really broad. Like we empower them with different understandings of Montessori and Waldorf and Reggio Emilia and all these great approaches. And then we actually support the learning competencies with evidence of the action in which supports that. So I think that speaks to exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, that's really the only way we can craft a learning environment like that. Uh, on a mass scale is to support what they know with documentation and evidence, learning artifacts, not a quantified test. Because obviously you and I both know that that is not an accurate display of a child's intelligence because, 
you know, I am so tired of hearing a child that can close their eyes and draw to scale something that they just saw be quantified as non-intelligent in the system because they can't, you know, regurgitate information in the way that the county. So I think it's really interesting, the environment you're talking about for how to keep kids motivated and, and kind of in, in the game when it comes to their work. I think the challenge being is that, you know, to do that, given the certain circumstance that the kids are provided now in elementary, which is you have this stuff to do and here's when you have to be online. I think that that is a way in which we could get that done, even in the public schools, is to say, rather than quantifying with these tests, like, let's support it with evidence, because really every child learns differently. And so that's really the only way we can assess if that makes sense. Yeah, my big inspiration for going into self-directed education came from one of my students that I had before I did it. So my um, my experience before I got to embark is I worked in the public school system, Fairfax County Public Schools, as a clarinet coach and a private clarinet teacher. Cool. But, yeah, it's great. And I still do it a little bit. I don't know how much I'll be doing this year. but <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a busy year for you. Oh my gosh. But, um, and I used to call it clarity, um, to quote a friend of mine who's another clarinet <laughs> teacher, because a lot of times I would sit there for 30 minutes with a young person who was crying because she or he were overwhelmed with all the testing, so much testing. And it just, the pressure gets harder and harder and harder for them as they get older, because they've got to go to this specific college. And I, I, I really feel like that pressure from parents and society to get into an Ivy League or a top tier school. It's just so cruel for people. Yeah. And, and they would just, it would be devastating watch what, watching what was happening to these young people. And and then I'd say, all right, uh, you got to play a chromatic scale <laughs> so we can say that we did clarinet for just a little bit. And yeah. I, had, I had a young man who could, he could literally chop down a tree and make a cabinet out of it for his mother for Mother's Day. He was an absolutely incredible young man. He made chain mail and researched whichever time period he wanted to make this specific chain mail from. And yet he was failing all of his multiplication tests. And he was struggling socially in school because all of those things go into it. You know, if you're that kid that's pulling the whole class down, then that's also going to reflect on you. And he would come in for his lessons. And each lesson, I remember thinking, the light is going out of his eyes. I am very Aww. scared. And I called his mom and, and um, she said, she started crying and she said, there's nobody that sees him. Um, there I am. Um, so, he, you know, she, his mom was saying, you're not seen, he, you know, he's not being seen for who he is. And that was my moment where I thought I've got to make a place or find a place where people can be seen for who they are. School can work for some people. They can do it. They can do the pros and cons and they can play that game, but other people can't. And it's just, I think just cruel and unhealthy to do that to young people. So he never got to go to Embark, but um, other people do get to go to Embark. Um, but he was my person that really um, inspired me to help children outside of school. And my kids never went to school. I always asked them if they wanted to go and they said no. <laughs> and so I've been a lifelong homeschooler on that side with my kids. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, no. So I can't hear you, Garrett. One minute. Okay. I'm going to try it again. I'm waiting. There we go. So I'm just hanging out, waiting for Garrett to come back. Oh, it's just me again. Now it's me. There you are. Okay, good. Jeez okay. Louise. This thing it drives me nuts sometimes. Oh. I'm looking for a better platform out there, people. So just to, so you know. Um, but yeah, no, I absolutely heard what you were saying um, when it comes. I heard you the whole time. So that's oh, good. good. Okay. 
Um, but I think with you, with uh, with homeschooling and your kids being at home, there's been very little, I would imagine, other than – they're probably not even plugged into the system, are they? LCPS. They no, the, no. As a matter of fact, sometimes they would come with me when I would go do sectionals at school or teach clarinet lessons. And right. one of the things that, because if I came after school with them and they just sit in the back until their dad could pick them up, um, the um, all the kids would be leaving school at the same time, like salmon swimming upstream and my and we'd be coming in and my kids are like, why do they want to get out so badly? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's probably a really interesting perspective, given that they haven't been um, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, she's 10. She went to Montessori school pretty much the entire track because I was always the principal or. Uh, the founder or whatever it may be. But, uh, and then she transitioned to public school in first grade, I believe. Sec first grade. Um, and did okay. But it was interesting because she kind of said the same thing. She, to this day, and she's in fifth grade now, she's like, can we go back to Montessori school? Yeah. Where, and, and, and I think that doesn't necessarily speak to, I mean, the pedagogy or the philosophy or anything. I think it much more speaks to, um, the independence that they, that she was given as a as a human, um, and overall the education, the the freedom of choice, like you were saying, um, is huge. I think in in the motivation to learn, and even at our school we have a learning cycle, and in that learning cycle, it kind of helps all the classrooms stay cohesive in how we learn. Uh, the first one is in, it's engage, motivate, share. So. The first step in that is engage. You have to engage a learner in motivational uh, concepts. So even when you're presenting a new concept to a child, there's almost this sense of wonder that has to be in, instilled in a child to get that sense of the brain thinking in a way that is curious. And I think that curiosity drives motivated learning. And, and um, it's, it's so far from how the current situation is not only just in public school post or pre-COVID, but definitely in public school post-COVID. So you're watching, I think one, you're going to be a, a very busy person moving forward because I think self-directed learning, this is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about every child now Loudoun County released the schedule. Every kid literally differently ha or has a different schedule. So, you know, it's going to be an extreme challenge for families moving forward who had a tough time in the spring, you know, getting all this done. So I think good on you for kind of taking the leap to in, to take the power back when it comes to our education system and, and deliver that to your kids. Now, obviously, not everybody has that opportunity. Um, now, let's talk learning environments. So how do you structure, because I think this is, I, I again, love to provide value to our, our viewers. So when we're talking about learning environments, how do you structure, is there a structure to the learning environments that you, you provide for your kids as well as your clients at Embark? Um, and what are some kind of things that you want to make sure that you are thinking about when it comes to a learning environment? Yeah, let's talk to, about Embark. It's not that dissimilar than what I do with my own kids. And my daughter goes to Embark. My son will occasionally drop in there. And they're 16 and 14. Um, Very cool. They, that's their ages. And so Embark has a structure where the classes are member driven. So if members want a particular class, they'll bring it up at community meeting or they can talk about it amongst themselves, see if they get enough people gathered up that they want to do it. Um, members are able to lead classes just as staff like um, I can and our founder, Andrea Cabela McKay, who also came from Montessori. She did Montessori for decades. Love it. Founded um, so we can teach it. Sometimes we have people um, come from the outside to teach it. We have different volunteers that come in and teach classes. So that's it. that's once again what I was talking about with the member driven programming that we had. Um, we have. And before COVID-19 hit, we did a lot outside in the community. We do a lot of field trips. Uh, we do a lot of volunteering. Um, there's internships and apprenticeships, and we have members going to community college. So we have all sorts of things going on like that. Um, but one of the more important parts of our structure that makes us a little different than, let's say, um, an unschooling school or a Sudbury school would be we have mentor meetings with staff. So once a week, I get together with my mentee and I say, hey, what are, what are you working on? What are you passionate about? What do you need support with? Do you not need any support? I'm here for 
for you in whichever way you need me. So that can be anything from, hey, let's go take a walk down to the creek and see if we can catch some crayfish so we can stick them in a tank and see if we can identify what kind they are and how they work to, hey, I need some help getting into community college or I don't really think college is the right choice for me. What are my options? Can I look at being an apprentice for an electrician or can I volunteer at this animal shelter and maybe get my foot in the door there? So what's great about our program is it's small enough that we can, each individual person, we work with them with what they want and what their goals are. So we don't have an overall um, plan for the whole system. It's, it's basically what you want and where to go from there. Yeah, and I think that that's ultimately personalized learning at its finest, right, is, is I tell families a lot when they're, when they're, you know, enrolling here and they're learning about our school that I say, I don't want to be the school that says we have it completely down and we're not changing. I want to be the school that iterates to meet the needs of our families, our children uh, overall. And I think that's kind of the best way to do it is, uh, in my mind, right, is you have a good sense of what a child needs to know right? And then you know that you have the time. I think that's a, a, a nice thing about homeschooling and a nice thing about, um, you know, progressive private approaches as well, too, is knowing that you have the span of a year, uh, the span of two years, the span of the lifetime of the child uh, in their schooling to, to understand and learn these competencies. And, you know, Montessori specifically talks a lot about sensitive periods in children. So children being sensitive to certain subjects and concepts at certain age groups and levels in their um, development. And so, and then of, of course, delivering upon that. So when a child shows interest or they show the entrance into a sen sensitive period, which there are signs of seeing that it's same thing with, you know, any age uh, to follow that and to follow that, that uh, I intensely so that you can kind of fuel that need to learn. Um, and, you know, I think we focus a lot on, um, on memorization and regurgitation when we have devices that do that for us. Like that's the real world. And I think time could be spent um, during, especially COVID with the, you know, the school board and any school board, whether it be Fairfax Loudon, and really unpacking that and saying like, we have clear issues that are happening. You know, when you have a situation like COVID, it points out all of these macro problems um, because what I'm going to be interested in is how this plays out at the end of this year, you know, cause I don't think that we're going to potentially be going back until next year, potentially. Yeah. Um, and, but then looking at the outcomes from this year and how it all worked out. So it'll be really interesting, but I think people like you have a leg up on what that will look like because this has been kind of your world for a while now. Yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, I am so happy that you talked about time. It gave me goosebumps because usually that's something I talk about and nobody, <laughs> nobody has beat me to it and you beat me to it. And I'm so happy that you did. <laughs> so I'm, you know, it would have been something I forgot about. Sure. But when I say that we have classes, it starts at 10, but it could go to two or it, gets, it starts at 10 and it might go to 10, 10 because people really aren't into it that day. Yeah. Um, one of the jokes we have about our Minecraft class, which is a really great class. It started out with me being very teachery going, we're gonna do world history through Minecraft. And it ended up being more about how to collaborate and compromise and you know have consensus when people are working together. And that had much more value to the, the people in the class than me building a volcano in, in Pompeii. <laughs> Um, and that class can start at 11 o'clock on Monday and finish up on Thursday at two because everybody gets really into it and they're building and they're working together and they're learning so much. I'm one of the people that, that, that tries to encourage parents not to be so scared of video games, especially right now when all these children are trapped inside. It's a way for them to have free play together because they can't go free play at the playground right now. And... I know that there are issues with screen time, which is a whole other thing with what's going on with kids being in front of the screen for six hours. But when they're collaborating and working together, the, the sense of time is so different. And you know what it's like, too, when you're working with somebody and they get in the zone and all of a sudden you're in a flow state and you know, 45 minutes have gone by and you thought it was 10 minutes, so yeah. have, you know, and so that's a great part on the, the micro level. But the macro level is that sometimes you have a class and it sort of finishes up. 
you know, and it might not be the whole year. You might not need a whole year for it. You might not need a semester for it. It might just be finished up in about six or seven weeks. And that's okay. You can move on. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's uh, brilliantly said. You know, Montessori was nice for me uh, growing up as a Montessori teacher and, you know, all of that, where you had that, that pillar, right? I think the pillar of time has has really excelled over money, excelled over anything right now. I think time is the most important factor to a lot of people. And to be able to have the grace of time, even as an educator, right? To say like, we, we look at it from the learner side of things and they have the less a less amount of anxiety and stress to ensure that they cram it all in so that they can regurgitate it, right? So they, they now have the freedom to kind of, okay, I have the time to learn this concept. I'm not even worried about it. And those are the best states of learning, right? Where you're calm, you're not in your fight or flight, you're just chilling, you're open. Um, and then teachers have less stress because they feel like we have an indefinite amount of time for a child to learn this concept through any vessel. So it could be through Minecraft. It could be, and I think, honestly, you point out, yes, we do have a lot of problems with screen time. I think a lot of those problems are adults putting their own perspective on the current situation. So yeah, we didn't grow up with screen time. And yes, we didn't grow up with devices. And I didn't have the ability when I was growing up in the 80s to do a live Facebook show where I have people on virtually. You know what I mean? So a lot of what we do is we put a child's experience into the frame of our perspective. And what ends up happening is these kids shouldn't be doing this the way I grew up. Well, guess what? That was in the 80s. We're not in the 80s anymore. We're in the future where we have real-time Star Trek stuff that, that kids can use, and it's not going away. I think that's the other thing. You called it out perfectly. Like, Video games, guess what, parents? You can shelter your kids and say no video games, but guess what they're going to do when they get older? They're going to be a video game designer just to errant you because they were told no their entire time. You know, like for the same reason, like for me in my experience, I was told for many years that I couldn't be a drummer in a band and that wouldn't make money or anything like that. And I ended up turning around and doing it. You know what I mean? Like that was my career after high school. So a lot of the times you know, we tend to put our own perspective. Would you find that a lot too? Like, I know you work a lot with families at, at, with self-directed directed learning. And I know that families can be, especially parents can be the, myself included with my own child. So don't think that I'm not guilty of this, but the block in a, a child's great education. So do you find that that's something that you run into quite a bit? Yes. So we do support <laughs> the whole family. And, Good. and a lot of times when our members get to us, I'd say nine times out of 10 that they found us or they really wanted to be with us. And then we do have some where the parents think it would be best for them and, and they're not ready. They're, they're resistant. But most of the time we're working with parents to sort of ease their fears and help them realize that they're going to be okay. Their child is going to be okay. As a matter of fact, it's going to be much, much better for their child at a moment. Mm. And sometimes it takes a while, but most of our parents come around and they, they see the worth that it has. And they'll say things like, oh, my gosh, she's I saw her smiling again. And our whole family is feeling a lot better because she was so angry or she was fighting with us or she was so depressed. And, and we do have kids that really, really struggle in school. And then they come to us and it just, it just opens up. We had two members um, last year, they've moved on this year, but they described it like and when you do self-directed education and you're supported with it, it's like the people that support you lift up a rock and then you can grow the way you were meant to grow. But yes. traditional education, the way they were experiencing it, it was a rock on top of them and they had to sort of squeeze out and it was deforming them. They couldn't grow the way they needed to grow, to naturally grow. So we want to be the we want to lift that rock up so that you can grow the way you need to grow. Absolutely, and and again, in so much agreeance there. I think for me, a great middle ground because obviously we talk about the world and different situations and perspectives, and not everybody has the ability to homeschool their kids. I think the the true answer to education is to meet 
in the middle and say, we can provide these environments you can send your children to um, that speak to the learner first and to say, like, let's take the time. Let's know that we have, you know, now anywhere between like, 12 years, really, that you're in school. Um, you have those 12 years to get to some kind of readiness. And the goal shouldn't be, in my mind, the list of things that, you know, the, the government decides for you. Those that 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 metric should be, is my child prepared for the life that they want to lead? And that, I think, is so, so important. Um, the, the, yeah. And I think, you know, there are ways to do that. I've been working my whole career in, in which to do so. And, and I think this and I wanted to kind of pivot into this as we kind of wrap up in a little bit. But when, when it comes to COVID and I asked this question to uh, I had, I had um, a gentleman on that uh, uh, his name was Tom. Uh, Sayer, and he was a co-founder of a company called Trussell, and he worked as the uh, director of Google for Education and their customer success. So he's a really, really smart dude, but we talked a lot about um, COVID and how this could be a opportunity to pivot into a new realm of what education looks and feels like. So do you feel, are you hopeful that, um, you know, with this time now, getting close to almost, you know, it's probably going to be a full year, uh, at least now in quarantine. Um, are you hopeful through all this? I, I, I am. I, <laughs> I was on a Facebook group and somebody said, what is one thing that you could, if you could go back in time and tell yourself in the past as a homeschooler from before, what would you tell yourself about the future? And, it, you know, most people were saying things like that. Everything's going to be OK or my son will learn how to read. And I agree with all those. And I said, for me, I would tell myself that one day overnight <laughs> after 12 years of being on the fringe of society as this crazy homeschooler slash unschooler slash supporter of child led learning that you would become an expert and everybody would want to talk to you about it. And the, the, if I were to say that in for everybody that's new for homeschooling this year, a lot of you never thought about it. You never wanted to do it. You never thought you could do it and you can do it. So my hopeful part is that people will be able to spend time with their children and see who they are and see how they learn in a way that they couldn't before. Yes, it's awful. And, and we're stuck at home, but it's an opportunity for people to spend more time with each other and get to know each other better. And of course, I say that coming from a place of privilege, it's not going to be that wonderful for everybody. And there will be a lot of people struggling. But if you're one of the families that can take a step back and take a breath and say, you know what, my child isn't going to fall behind or, you know, they, I, I don't have to worry about them catching up. I don't know if you saw that picture of that poor little boy that was crying on his first day of kindergarten. Those are the ones that make me the saddest because kindergarten, you're just learning everything. You're absorbing it all just by being five and six. And, and I really, for all of us, but the little ones in front of the screens, I, I really hope that a sea change comes that people just realize we don't have to double down on the old system. That's right. We can create a new system. This is unprecedented. So it gives us an opportunity to have unprecedented change. What people are doing by trying to make it into school at home isn't working and it's not going to work. And I think it's we're going to feel it soon. There'll be waves of people in pain and dropping out from this and we need to think outside the box and change it. And that's, you know, it's interesting because I've been in this movement for a long time. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago when I'm saying learner-centered education and working with these Silicon Valley companies and, um, you know, really talking in, in a thought leadership role around what education should look like, you know, people, like you said, people thought I was a cuckoo bird in the sense of like, what? But I think what, what that comes down to is, again, that parent attaching experience to their child and their child's education. And how that is mitigated is through... Um, great education on the parent end of things. And I think the, the thing that you said is the most important step. It's like almost step one, which is completely detach yourself from what you thought school should look like and be. Uh, because that's step one. When you actually do the research in history, like I'm sure you and I have, is 
you know, you realize that this model was created in an industrial age to prepare kids for factory work. Like, and it makes sense. Like, look at school and look at the way it operates. And yeah, it makes sense. And of course, there's been some minor change to that model over time. And, you know, Loudoun County says we're personalized learning, but that's just a buzzword. And are they really doing it? That's questionable. Um, that included a Chromebook for everybody. I don't know how that became personalized learning. But um, but the reality is, I think that number one shift is will is now being forced, is to say, now you have to unthink everything that you thought was school, because it's no longer that, in action, in real life. And even if parents are still stuck, like you said, in that mindset of here's what school should look like. So it's so funny, and I'm sure you laugh at it too on Facebook when you see these desk setups and how it looks and you're like, what are you doing? You have the opportunity to not do that. See, right. like we don't have to send our kids to an environment where they're doing that. Like, let's not do that. Let's do something different. Um, but I think it'll force, even through those pain points of parents realizing yeah. that that stuff doesn't work, um, it's still going to, it's an accelerator for, oh, yeah. for what we've, I think, been striving for all along. I absolutely so. agree. I started out that way with my five-year-old. I got a little desk and a chalkboard and I was going to stand <laughs> in front of it and it lasted one hour before we were snuggled up on the couch, yeah. reading together, doing that workbook together, or doing the Cuisinaire rods on the floor, sitting at the kitchen table. And then it turned to, we used to call it car schooling because we'd be driving to all these different classes and groups and park days and things like that and we listen to audiobooks and podcasts it really is part of your life and your family i i think about all the people that that learned before industrialized schools started up i think about the bronte family and how their dad would invite cool people over to dinner so they would just sit and talk at the table and they had hours and hours and days and days to have free play and imagination work and then they wrote those incredible stories and that's just one that you can think of so you know if, if i were to give anybody advice with you know covid schooling or what's happening now with the distance learning i really would encourage people to look into other ways about it it doesn't have to be sitting in front of the computer for that you know six hours a day which is also in those compartmentalized times yeah so if you're in that flow and you're really into that math lesson sorry the industrial bell is still going to ring and you have to go to your next class yeah so that's what really bothers me is that we're trying to take the school out of the building and put it into the home and that's just not we don't have to do that we could have a whole new way of doing it you could really still have somebody on zoom that's a cool friend of yours and you guys could eat together and just talk and the kids could be hanging out and just absorbing all of that experience and i a million percent agree in the sense of god i i remember well even this summer right we did a school age summer camp we we opened our doors to a limited amount of kids during COVID and, and did a PBL camp where we had a theme each week. And the last theme that we did for the summer was Shark Tank, right? And the kids would have to develop a business. They would first have to identify a problem in their everyday lives. And then they would have to really think out a solution and what that solution would be in, in the form of an invention. Um, and then they would have to pitch that invention. In that process, me knowing the real world, right, as an entrepreneur and 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 someone that, you know, kind of had to grind it from the moment they got out of high school to even make something for themselves. Um, I found that in that experience, the questions that they were asking far more exceeded anything that they were learning in school um, that is relevant to our future. I think knowing Virginia's state bird right now is absolutely useless is absolutely because and i'll tell you why right if you're a bird watcher i think it's fantastic you should know that this is something you're into if you're into it great but at the end of the day when i can go alexa what's virginia state bird and it goes oh the cardinal oh okay cool that's good to know right we have to really look at and i think that's where those parents can start with that aha moment is think about Given the fact that we have tools now that give us every bit of information the world has ever, ever known, all at the palm of our fingertips, start asking those questions. Why does my child need to know this? Why? When 
they're doing these experiential learning things with you, with me, with my teachers, with your educators as well too, where we see the evidence, right? Le neurodiverse, learner diverse or not, they are pulling so much from these experiences beyond what's going to set them up for the future in the public school. So do you see a lot of, uh, you know, retention when it comes to experiential learning? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's off the charts. I mean, even from my own experience where I think about how I would have to just sort of, oh, this is really embarrassing, but I'll tell this story. I, I was one of those kids that really struggled with the multiplication tables and I'd have to memorize them and I could never do the test fast enough. So I'd always lose recess and I'd be sitting in the teacher's room. And then when my children were really little and they were just playing with math, because play is learn, and we didn't even start talking about play. Um, they were doing, um, they were, we were doing Singapore math and they were playing all these games and all of a sudden I realized, oh no, five apples and five apples, or five times five, like five groups of five apples is 25 apples. Like I had never ever conceptualized it. It was always just memorization. And I was 35 years old when I learned that it was actually five groups of five. And it was, it was, it was a very embarrassing moment for me, but a very powerful moment for me too, because I was like, wow, now I can forgive that little person for feeling really bad about herself for not being able to do this test fast enough. But then it was really exciting because it was like, what else do I not understand? Where do I go from here? What did I think I knew? And I don't know. So yeah, I, it was, we, do, we do see that. Yeah, no, I was going to say it's that organic, natural finding of, oh my goodness, like that's what it is. Those are the moments that we have to be shooting for in education because again, with that intrinsic motivation, that's what stokes it. Those are the little coals that go on the fire to keep things going is to have these self-discovery moments. We talk a lot about here at the school, having the child, getting the child to understand their, that concept, whatever it may be themselves and for themselves, for them to drive their own understanding of different learning um, concepts rather than us just giving the answer. You know, I, I've used a, um, a metaphor in the classroom of saying like, you know, you can go up to a tree with a kid and you can say, hey, this is a tree. And they look at it and they go, wow, cool. And then that's it. Or I love to look, especially with early learners, to engage that as if I've never seen it before. What is this thing growing from the ground that's green? I, have you ever seen anything like this before? What is this? The brain of the child immediately jumps into a whole different side of learning, right? That organic, natural, curious, they start questioning, they make guesses. Oh, that, that must be a, you know, a pipe cleaner. No. Well, what do you think? Well, let's feel, right? It feels kind of like a pipe cleaner. That's so cool. But children kind of getting to that own understanding themselves with g adults there doing what we should be doing, which is providing wisdom, because wisdom is something that we build over time. It's the only thing I believe that we have over kids, respect-wise, is wisdom. Um, and so I think we should be providing those loose boundaries for those moments to happen far more. I mean, look at countries like Denmark, look at countries like any Nordic country at all. Um, they score in the, the top even three in every subject and go to school less than every other uh, country in the world. And they spend less time per day in school than any other country in the world. Hmm. Less homework. Less the, homework. Yeah. yeah. And in some cases, no homework. So yeah. it's just, it's absurd to think that we, I mean, there's a lot of things going on around that, right? Is that we know the data, yet we totally ignore it and fight against it. I know. One of the trainings that I had when I, I did a lot of art of mentoring training, which is nature-based training. And one of the ones that is just wonderful fun is coyote guiding, which is what you're talking about. So you don't answer the question directly. It's more like, uh, the guided questions that you had. And so we went out and the plant that we had was yarrow and um, it's beautiful and feathery and it's a medicinal plant. But I mean, she, the, our instructor had us lying in the grass and holding it up to the sun. And, and it's so, it was so different than sitting down and reading about it in a book. And we keep talking about our smartphones and it's like, I'm talking to myself with what you're saying about it, because when I was a child and I was obsessed with dolphins, the best 
best I could do was go have somebody, you know, take me to the library That's when one. the library was open. That's and then, two. You know, and then I have to, you know, figure out the Dewey Decimal System to find out where the book is, <laughs> and then I check out the book, and then I can read this book about a dolphin, but I can't hear the dolphin. I can't see the nope. dolphin swimming. I nope. don't, you know, see the pods of dolphins, and I don't have thousands of videos of dolphins to, that I can just look right up right now on my phone. That's it's right. absolutely incredible the amount of information that we that all of us have access to instantly. And yet um, we're still going to school to regurgitate that stuff. And the children that are moving forward into the future, their skills are going to be so different. It's no longer what we talked about earlier, the industrialized school system, the industrialized right. system, the industrialized school system. That's all it's robots are taking this for us. And that's great. It can put us in a whole new place. So what are the big skills that people need? Collaboration, um, compromise, leading, empathy, following. You know, following is a skill too. Yeah. Yeah. And and really being able to play it just because those are all natural parts of play. Absolutely. Katina, I feel like, yeah, there's definitely a mind meld going on. If people watch this show, they know like you're saying you're preaching to the choir right now. I think it's, it's super important that people start listening. You know, I think both you and I are people that are, are experienced in, in outside the box styles of education. And I always look at it this way. Like, I'm a big proof is in the pudding kind of guy. Like I'm a big data driven kind of guy. And I like, uh, you know, to know that the things that I'm doing work and if they're not, then I change them. Right. And I think now we see by and large that one, our system doesn't work. Our current industrial system doesn't work. And two other methods actually really do work. So at some point, hopefully post COVID, we can start that shift. But unfortunately, we, I mean, I could go on forever and ever. We could be on for hours. Uh, Katina has a different show that she's doing. I'm not jealous. I mean, whatever. Fine. <laughs> go do another show. I don't care. No, I'm kidding. Maybe um, I can come back. Maybe we can no, visit them. <laughs> yeah, we definitely will. I think my next, uh, you know, to, to have guests on again, I think we're going to do a panel where we have a larger discussion um, around education. I think that's super important. But friends, um, please, please, please visit. How can they find the Embark Center online? And then how can they find you online? Oh, okay. So EmbarkCenter.org is our website. We Got have it. a Facebook page, Embark Center. We have an Instagram account, Embark Center. And that one's really fun. Once we start up again, a lot of our members are the ones that do postings for that too. Great. Um, and you can find me on Facebook, Tina Franklin Sweetie. And I'm on Twitter as CF Sweetie. And LinkedIn. I'm trying to think of the places you can find me. <laughs> That's um, good. You're on all those places. And then, um, and then I, I do have a whole other clarinet life, so you might bump into some of that too. Um, and then the one thing I wanted to say, just going back real fast, one of the things about homeschooling and being able to homeschool is yes, a financial privilege being able to do that. But Embark is a nonprofit, and we will work with any family regardless of their financial situation to to make it work for them if it's not possible for them to be able to afford Embark. So I want to I want everybody to hear that one more time, and let me paraphrase that: the e equitable learning. What Katina is saying is. If you need help, they're there no matter what your situation. And thank God. Now, that being said, I've got a lot of friends out there, and I'm pointing right at you guys out there. Uh, if you want a place to donate, this is the place to do it because they definitely uh, do some amazing work. We have mutual friends that we talked about off show, and I've seen some amazing things happen with some of the learners I know that attend. Um, and I just, I really, really want you guys to know that if there's any donate button to click, please visit the Embark Center and, and donate as much as you possibly can during this time. Because I want to remind all of you guys out there that every problem that we are facing currently in this world could be solved with meaningful, authentic education. And that's just the truth. So thank you for what you do, Katina. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Again, we're going to make this work again yes. because I could just continue picking your brain and I'm sure parents are going to need some help. So I'm going to jump her off and uh, say goodbye to everybody. 
Thank you guys so, so much for uh, joining me here today at, at the Gardens. Once again, an amazing conversation that's totally unexpected. I love these things. They, they really bring value to me and I hope bring value to you out there. Please continue to tune in. We have amazing guests for the rest of the week. The show is every day. Sometimes I won't be there to do it, but that's okay. It's every day. We're going to try. We're going to do our best. That's all I can do. Um, but that being said, continue to tune into the show. And as always, keep your head up and keep moving forward. Have a great day.